This video is sponsored by Brilliant. 2.718281 and so on. This is E or Euler's number. And I remember when I learned this in high school, I thought, when would that even show up in the real world? But now I realize the better question is, when doesn't that show up? Or at least that feels like a fair question. Now, mathematically, E is just what you get when you calculate one plus one over a really big number to that same really big number. And as that number gets bigger and bigger, you get Euler's number. Now, if you're in high school and just learned about this, it's probably because you're in the compounding interest part of the curriculum, which is where I'm gonna begin. So let me first try to intuitively explain what this seemingly random number really is. Imagine you put $1 in a bank that pays out 100% interest per year. That means after one year you'll have $2, but that's only if the interest compounds once a year. If instead it compounds twice per year, then that means you get 50% after six months and another 50% after six more months. So after that first six months, you'd have $1.50, and after another six months, you'd get 50% of that, which would leave you with $2.25, a little more than before. If instead the interest compounded four times per year, then you get 25% every three months. The first payment would leave you with $1.25, then 25% of that leaves you with $1.56, another 25% gives you $1.95, and the final 25% gives you about $2.43. So notice that the final value keeps going up. If the interest compounded daily, we'd end up with a little more than $2.71. And as we keep going up to compounding every hour, second, microsecond, nanosecond, and so on, the amount in your bank would become E dollars after a year. Now that's what we learn in high school at the minimum. But now let's see the other times that E shows up across math and science in ways that usually have nothing to do with compounding interest. And I'm gonna start with some more random examples. The first one being probability. Let's say there's a one in a million chance of winning the lottery. If you then play the lottery a million times, your odds of losing every time is about one over E or 36.8%. Well, approximately. And this will always be the case for games with small probability. The reason for this is because a one in a million chance of winning means you have a 0.999999 chance of losing or one minus one over a million. Raise that to the one million and those are your odds of losing every single time. And as this value gets very large, since we have a minus sign this time, the whole thing will approach 1 over E. Then next up, imagine a party where everyone brings an umbrella. After the party's over, people are in a rush and everyone grabs a random umbrella from the stack, not caring if it's theirs or not. The probability that no one left with their same umbrella is again about 1 over E, if the number of guests is pretty large. Another way to look at this is take a fresh deck of cards that's in proper order and shuffle it. If you do so randomly, there's about a 1 over E chance that no card is in its original spot. Next up, let's say you interview 100 people for a secretary job, and you judge them all by something like typing speed that can be given a value. Now after each interview, you can either hire them or never see them again, and you're only going to pick one person. So how would you pick the optimal candidate? Because with each interview, even if the person has a fast typing speed, you never know if there's someone better that you just haven't interviewed yet. Well, the math says if you have 100 interviews lined up, first interview 100 over E of them, or about 37 people. However, you do not pick any of those first 37. You just keep track of who is the best. You will then pick the next person who is better than any of those first 37 people. And not only does E show up in the number of people you interview before making a decision, but if you follow this algorithm, you have a one over E chance of picking the best one. And this probability stays the same no matter how many people you have to interview. So even if you have a million interviews lined up, just interview a million over E of them and then pick the next best person and you'll have a one over E chance of picking the best one of those one million. Now here's a random one. If you take a stick of length 10 and chop it up into two pieces, you get lengths of five and five, whose product is 25. If you instead divide it into three pieces, you get lengths of 3.33 for each, whose product is 37.037. If you cut the stick up into four pieces, each length is 2.5, and the product will be 39.0625. And lastly, if you make five divisions, every piece is length two, and the product is 32. Notice the maximum product happens when there are four divisions, which is also when the length of each piece is closest to E. That will in fact always be the case, 
as in to maximize the product, cut up whatever length you have into equal pieces such that each piece is as close to E as possible. For the calculus people out there, to prove this, you can find that the maximum of some length divided by x times itself x times occurs at x equals that length over E. Now, if you're saying, wow, I really don't like how often E shows up in these random examples, then you're not going to like this next one. Imagine a function that is x to the x to the x and so on forever, or the infinite tetration. Now, this will diverge from most values, of course, like if you plug in 5 for x, this is obviously going to go to infinity. But it will converge for any x between 1 over e to the e and the eth root of e inclusive, which are about 0 0.066 and 1.4447 respectively. So if you plug in something like the square root of 2 or 1.414, since it's within those bounds, it will converge to a certain number. In this case, it actually converges to 2. But if you plug in something slightly out of the bounds, like 1.45, then it just goes to infinity. Now, moving on, this next example came up on an old Putnam exam, which is a university level math competition that consists of what I think most would consider extremely difficult math problems. To set this up, we first pick a random number between 0 and 1, let's say 0.682 in this case. Then pick another, we'll say 0.145. And we keep going until the sum exceeds 1. So right now the sum is 0.827, as in we need to keep going. If our next number is 0.394, our sum is now greater than 1 and we stop. Notice it took three numbers for the sum to exceed 1. Now if you did this with truly random numbers over and over, turns out on average the amount of numbers you'd write down before the sum exceeds 1 is E. And the competition problem was to prove that this was the case. E to the x also has, in my opinion, a very weird property that its rate of change is always itself. As in if you were in a hypothetical rocket whose position was modeled by e to the t, where t is time, then your position, velocity, acceleration, and so on will always match. Which means when you're at, let's say, the 127 meter mark, your velocity would be 127 meters per second, your acceleration would be 127 meters per second squared, and so on. There's another interesting property when finding the area under e to the x, as the area from negative infinity to 1 is e to the 1. If we go to 2, the area is e to the second, and this would apply to any number. For the majority of you who've taken calculus, I know this is obvious, but it's still interesting to think about. Now, probably the biggest reason that e is so applicable is because of this identity. Well, it's actually where this identity comes from, which is something known as Euler's formula. I've explained where this formula comes from in a previous video, so I'm not going to do that again. But with the formula, you can see where that identity on the thumbnail comes from. Just plug in pi for x, and you get e to the pi i equals cosine of pi plus i sine of pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1, and sine of pi is 0, and thus we have our answer. With this formula, you can show some really weird math with imaginary numbers, by the way. I'm not going to show where these come from, but if any of you guys have a graphing calculator nearby, go ahead and plug in any of these, which look like they should give you a calculator error or something like that, but in fact they all equal real numbers that include e and pi. Now going back, what Euler's formula really does is relates an exponential function with e as the base to sinusoidal functions. And a typical sinusoidal function is seen in way too many applications to even name. From signal analysis to quantum mechanics, circuits, a simple mass on a spring, and so on. These all involve some sort of oscillation, which is why you can expect to see Euler's formula. I mean, if you just look at any circuits textbook, once you get to the alternating current section, all voltage inputs are sinusoidal. So when capacitors and resistors change the amplitude and phase of that input signal, it's harder to use traditional pre-calc math to represent the system. So instead we use Euler's formula to analyze everything. Like seriously, it's everywhere in these textbooks. Or just look at an electromagnetism textbook. Since electromagnetic waves, including radio waves, visible light, x-rays, and more, are sinusoidal, we use Euler's formula to represent them. And here you can see basically Euler's formula with some more complexity in the exponent. And one of the most groundbreaking discoveries in math was that any function can be represented as a summation of sine and cosine functions. As in if you add enough of them up, usually an infinite amount, you can create any other function that you want. In regards to audio and music, the Fourier transform gives us the ability to analyze frequencies that make up a certain sound signal. 
And this is used for auto-tuning, removing unwanted frequencies or noise from a signal, amplifying specific notes, and more. The Fourier transform is also useful in quantum mechanics, astronomy, optics, and so on, but signal analysis is definitely one of its most famous uses. And of course, if we look at the underlying math, it involves Euler's formula. As some more examples of these real-world applications, when you let a block on a spring oscillate in some fluid, it will oscillate back and forth with a slightly lower amplitude every time. The envelope of this equation that kind of squeezes it to zero has an exponential decay equation, which includes e to some negative constant times time within it. Or when you take a pie out of the oven, it will eventually cool to the temperature of the room it's in. But it cools down much faster at first, and then that temperature equation kind of flattens out over time, asymptotically approaching room temperature. This equation is that same exponential decay that has an e to the power of some negative value times time. Alright, now time for the weirdest part of this video. Here we can see the graph of x squared times e to the minus x. The area under it from 0 to infinity is exactly 2, which can also be written as 2 factorial. Now we'll graph x to the third times e to the minus x. The area under this from 0 to infinity is 6, aka 3 factorial. And here's x to the fourth times e to the minus x, whose area from 0 to infinity is 24, or 4 factorial. So as you can see, the exponent here, factorial, will equal the area under the curve from 0 to infinity. Another way to write this is the integral of this curve from 0 to infinity equals that exponent we see here, factorial. And this takes us to the gamma function, which is written a little differently, but says the same thing. And what this is is an extension of the factorial function. So if we wanted to find any integer factorial, we could just use this formula. But note that this equation could have anything in the exponent, not just integers. So if you ever see something weird like 1 half factorial is the square root of pi over 2, it comes from this equation. In fact, if we go back to Desmos, I've graphed the equation and calculated the area under it from 0 to a big number, since infinity wouldn't work, as a function of z. So if we set z equal to 4, for example, we get 24 or 4 factorial as expected. And if we set z to 3, we get 6 or 3 factorial. But now we can let z equal 1 half, and it spits out what would be 1 half factorial, which like I said equals the square root of pi over 2. And this is also another way to see why 0 factorial is in fact 1, because when z is 0, the area under this curve is 1. The gamma function shows up in quantum physics, astrophysics, fluid dynamics, and more. But from what I've seen, it's typically very advanced. Like, it can be used to calculate the volume of n-dimensional hyperspheres, or basically spheres in higher dimensions. Or on a paper regarding the Casimir effect, which appears in quantum field theory, the gamma function shows up several times in ways that I totally understand. And next to the gamma function, which itself has Euler's number within it, we have Euler's number showing up. So yes, this does have more applications than you may think. But now we're going to see what's definitely my favorite part of this video. We're going to go back to that hypersphere example because there was something I found when doing research for this that just did not sit well with me. Let's say we calculate the volume of a sphere with radius 1 in every even dimension. As in we find the volume of a 0 dimensional sphere, a 2 dimensional sphere, 4 dimensional, 6, and so on forever, all with a radius of 1. And yes, in two dimensions, for example, a sphere is really just a circle, and volume really just refers to area. In this case, it'd be pi. But we're just using sphere and volume as general terms because of the higher dimensions. Anyway, if we add up the volumes of all those even-dimensional unit spheres forever, the summation would equal e to the pi. And no, I'm not joking. But the applications of Euler's numbers still don't stop there. Like the classic normal distribution or bell curve we see all the time contains Euler's number. The Laplace transform that's used to simplify calculations for things like circuits and control systems also includes Euler's number, and I could go on for a while. But if you want to keep learning about these unique areas of math and their applications, like with Euler's formula and imaginary numbers, you can continue to do so at Brilliant.org, who I'd like to thank for sponsoring this video. Brilliant is an educational platform that hosts a wide variety of math and science courses. They not only teach you the technical information you need to know for the various subjects, but they also challenge you constantly along the way with practice problems so you have a real fundamental understanding of what you're learning. The unique applications of mathematics is one of my favorite things to learn than discuss on this channel, and Brilliant is actually where I've gotten a lot of my information from. Like, if you enjoyed this video, then their complex algebra course may be something you find interesting. 
This course will take you through way more detail regarding imaginary numbers and why they're important within mathematics and even science or engineering. Plus, you'll learn exactly how Euler's formula applies to physics or engineering regarding signals and various complex systems. This kind of math really changed the way I looked at imaginary numbers and why we learn the things that we do. Brilliant also includes daily challenges that turn learning into a habit. These questions range from what happens when you cut a Mobius strip in half, to probability games within quantum systems, and much more to give you a range of topics to look forward to learning. Plus, they now have offline courses for iOS and Android, so you can download some of your favorite courses right to your phone. You can learn something new and stay productive whether you're commuting to work or school, traveling, or just somewhere with terrible internet. So if you want to get started right now and support the channel, you can click the link below or go to brilliant.org slash major prep to get 20% off your annual premium subscription. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group for updates on everything. And I'll see you all in the next video.